artist is mixing paint and neuroscience to end stigmas attached to addiction and encourage people to seek help. Painting hat. So I do get paint in my hair. What hair? <laughs> William Stair is a world-renowned artist. This is his technique. I'll kind of mix it around like this. And these are his subjects. Victims, witnesses, and survivors. The drip that's created may be random or an accident, but what I do with it is not. William's artwork has a purpose. Somehow I had to cause people to not just respond, but to maybe take some action or to feel differently about a subject. He wants to end the stigma that comes with addiction. My exposure to it really was through my sister, and this is my sister here, <coughs> this painting. And she overdosed, and uh, she had been suffering with um, alcoholism and addiction oh, probably for 30 or more years, and uh, she succumbed, and it was tragic. His own life experience with the sister, who he calls Emma in his artwork, is what drives him to make a difference in this world. I learned that it was very difficult, one, for our family to talk about this, but two, for my sister to seek help. And it was because of the stigma. In fact, one day she said, she said she was evil. She's not evil, she had a disease. Neuroscientist Nora Volkoff has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. She's the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which gave us these images. People still think that people are doing this to themselves. Dr. Volkoff uses imaging to understand the changes in the brain that addiction causes. She compares it to the way our bodies memorize a pleasurable response every time we eat or drink water. It motivates our bodies to continue doing those things without thinking about it because it's necessary for survival. But drugs have the capacity to generate and stimulate artificially those same systems, creating this strong memory that leads you to want to take the drug the next time that you are in the same environment. Dr. Wolkoff and William are working alongside each other to change people's perceptions of those struggling with addiction. They say art communicates emotion and a way to see things differently. William uses specific methods in his artwork to make people connect. It just grabs you as an emotion. I mean, this, this, these large faces. William says neuroscience taught him that people react strongly to a face with prominent eyes, and the ambiguity in his paintings forced people to fill in the blanks, allowing us to see ourselves in the paintings too. They are not different from us. They feel like us and, 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 and reach out to you to sort of feel that empathy, to generate an emotional reaction to them. His art also connects with survivors of addiction and encourages them to seek help. His art is what led his sister to rehab. I had tried everything. I was at wit's end and you know, just trying to remain calm and uh, tell her I loved her. And, and, and I went up to her door and I said, I'll paint your portrait if you go into rehab. The door opened just a crack and she said yes. When survivors look at his art, he says they can relate. A woman looked at one of my pieces and uh, she said that I knew exactly how she felt and that she wanted to die. But even though they may seem dark and solemn at first glance, they also portray hope. She looked at the very same piece the next morning and saw hope in the woman's eyes. And then she said, you saved my life. Now, I don't want people to feel bad. I want them to respond, to understand, to understand they're not alone and, and then to seek help. I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. My sister Emma Odeden died. Her daughter, my niece Sarah, found her lying on the living room floor with an empty bottle of pills. I often wonder if things would have been different without the stigma. The stigma faced by Emma, whether from the healthcare system, her community, family and loved ones, and even within herself, presented roadblocks to prevention, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, healing to everyone involved. I decided that eliminating stigma and normalizing the discussion was my first step to fighting substance use disorder. 
So today I'd like to discuss my personal experience, how I use my exhibitions and social media to fight stigma, describe my various collaborations and talk about my art, all in no particular order. Emma used booze, pot, meth in high school. After graduating, she left home and wasn't heard from for several months. No one knew where she was. No one knew what she was doing. No one knew if she was safe. And no one openly talked about it. One day, she simply called and asked for airfare to come home. When she had the first of her failed back surgeries, prescription opioids invaded her life. And when the pain continued, the doctors simply prescribed more. Our trusted small town family doctor said her spinal afflictions were the result of her falling down when drunk, which she did, but he was blind to and misdiagnosed the actual cause. He couldn't see the beautiful woman in front of him. All he saw was a drunk and an addict. He couldn't get beyond the stereotype, the stigma. I suspect if asked, he would say that, no, I'm not affected by stigma. Emma called this same family doctor to ask him to help her into a treatment facility. I was there. She was ready. I listened as he dismissed her saying, Oh, Emma, it's Sunday. And I just got home from church with my family. Call me after the office opens tomorrow. Emma ran to her room and slammed the door. To this doctor, she was simply someone who made bad choices. She was an embarrassment with two kids in an empty refrigerator. This toxic self stigma with all of its shame and embarrassment, no doubt caused Emma to not only avoid, but to sabotage treatment and support. This self loathing comes from the stigmatizing messages and behavior from parents, siblings, friends, healthcare professionals, law enforcement, media, insurance companies, and sometimes it just seems like everyone. Well, AA didn't work. The first intervention failed. She was kicked out of a residential treatment program. I think she did not see herself as worthy, or maybe it was simply a lost cause. You know, why even try? Well, she did finally try and for five years, she seemed to be in recovery. It was wonderful to see her laugh and smile, but two more back surgeries and more pills prescribed to a now known person in recovery. And she did relapse and she did die. That was nine years ago. So how did this affect my art? How did I discover my mission? So, well, let's go back 57 years. <clears throat> As you heard in the introduction, at 17, I desperately wanted to be an artist. My high school teacher introduced me to abstract expressionists and I was hooked. Given that I wanted to be an artist, my high school counselor suggested that I spend time with the local small town weekly newspapers illustrator. So now I'm thinking throwing paint like Jackson Pollock and everyone else is thinking me drawing ads for Elsie's dress shop. This wasn't going to work, but for a bunch of reasons, like not having much money, the Vietnam war. And if I was really honest with myself, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I did not go to art school. <clears throat> Instead, I went to a small state college in Northern Wisconsin where the tuition was $150 and I became an industrial engineer. I didn't paint or draw for maybe 40 years. I was simply onto a different life. Then in 2004, I woke up and said, Hey, I want to be an artist. I had a great job then with National Geographic, but I decided to resign. I figured I was young enough to begin another career and why not do what I wanted to do when I was a teenager. And at this stage of my life, I could afford to define success in my way. So while my skill and style was evolving quickly, I was not building a cohesive, focused and essential body of work. It took a few years to recognize my mission and artistic direction, you know, to find my voice. Well, actually my voice found me and it was in the back of my head whispering, 
What good is this so-called art of yours? What does it accomplish? Does it really matter? What is the larger conversation, the wider dialogue that you want to be part of? For me, the essence of my art became the exploration of what I called fundamental issues of our time. And I figured my job as an artist is to get you to react, think, ask questions, and then to respond. I wanted to make a difference. And so I started to broadly explore victims, witnesses, and survivors of war, discrimination, violence, abuse, bigotry, and the list just went on. Viewers interpreted my work with their own subjective context related to their own experiences. And this is exactly what I wanted. But again, the voice returned and asked, how can you honestly relate to all of these issues? Well, I can't, but I can relate to substance use disorder, not as a victim, but as a witness. And I know about stigma. <clears throat> stigma inhibits prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. And you see it all the time. Families are embarrassed, communities judge, medical professionals are dismissive, and victims are humiliated because they think they're not worthy or worse. <clears throat> And the harm just snowballs as victims with opiate use disorder are afraid to seek treatment for other medical issues because they fear the stigma that may come if their substance use is revealed. I think the first step toward alleviating stigma is normalizing the discussion and then helping people, all people, understand that substance use disorders are a treatable medical condition and not a moral failing. So stigma became my focus. It was my mission, the mission of my art. <clears throat> I tell people to think of substance use disorder like any other disease, pick one, cancer. With, ca with cancer, there's the possibility for remission and recovery. Same with substance use disorder. And like cancer, it can reoccur. And like cancer, it is not the result of a moral failing or character flaw. It is a disease of the brain. <clears throat> but you know what? Unlike cancer, so often the behavior of the person with substance use disorder can be embarrassing, offensive, and repugnant. It's hard to be around them when they lie and steal. It's hard to help. It's hard to take that phone call when you know they are drunk or high. And I'm sure it is hard to admit and treat them time and again, especially if they are experiencing homelessness or maybe use needles rather than pills. They need help and they do not deserve to die. And someone lost to an overdose left people behind who cared for them. With substance use disorder, it's never just one person that is impacted. And so the faces that I now paint are the faces of all of those affected, the victims, the witnesses, and the survivors. This is my attempt to normalize the discussion. So my exhibitions strive to help people understand that they are not alone, that there is hope, that people do change, and recovery does happen, but it's not easy. My exhibits include talks and panel discussions where best practices are shared. Typically, there are catalogs and literature to help people to get help. I also distribute and make readily available online, downloadable informational posters, and I am readily available to the media. Now, today, fentanyl makes this even more urgent. There's a flood of counterfeit pills, which look exactly like real oxycodone, Xanax, and others. They are laced with fentanyl and so potent that one can be fatal. Drug overdose deaths among U.S. teens have recently more than doubled at a time when teen drug use has remained constant. Teens experiment. They experiment with prescription drugs and they think these counterfeits are safe. We need to get the word out to these kids as soon as possible. We need to get them to listen. We need to do it in a way so they do listen. We need to talk to them about Narcan. We need to do more. 
As with AIDS, I believe normalizing the discussion to overcome this stigma will take a groundswell from artists, poets, playwrights, writers, teachers, scientists, elected officials, healthcare professionals, and you. And with the arts, well, this is already happening as we read the books, watch the movies, and listen to the music. <clears throat> Dr. Nora Volkov at the National Institute on Drug Abuse says that sometimes a portrait can cross boundaries that are impassable in real life. Through art, we can feel things in a new way, gaining perspectives that are different from our own. Art, by connecting us with one another, makes us aware that we are not alone and allows us to experience the suffering and the joy of being alive. In this way, art opens the door for empathy and for overcoming the fear and shame that are so commonly encountered when dealing with people suffering from addiction. I want art events to be a forum. They are easier to attend. There is no stigma attached to attending. It's just a public art opening. It is intense, but not threatening. It's an easy first step to normalize the discussion as student groups tour, high school and university classes come, and of course, many more people attend. I know that some come for the art, but stay for the message. What did they say? Can you feel what she feels? Can empathy beget action? People have passionate reactions to my work. Some stand before the paintings and cry. Some share their heartfelt, tragic, personal stories. Many write me, some call me. Some say they intend to get help or take that first step to finally start that intervention. Some thank me simply for recognizing them. I exist, I am not alone. I am still a person. Hear my story and their stories. We were the poster children for stigma. We didn't even tell family members. We were embarrassed. We thought we did something wrong as parents. Then our biggest fear happened. We got that late night knock on the door. We didn't know that prescription medications were in the game. We had no clue until we got that call that he was dead. I had Narcan at home and we were able to revive her. She has overdosed three times that I'm aware of. I still carry it with me, even though she has grown. I'm still quiet about it when I see people, but usually when I open up, I find that there's somebody in their family that is also affected with the disease. <clears throat> I can't remember when I felt more alone than I have ever in my life. I washed an entire bottle of Xanax down with a fifth of Jack Daniels. I tried calling every place I could think of for help, but I couldn't afford it because I didn't have insurance. I cried and passed out from the drugs and alcohol. The next day I woke up down the street laying against an apartment building. That loneliness I felt almost cost me my life. If your message reaches one person that feels alone like I did, to let them know that they are not alone, it could save their life. I believe in the power of art to normalize the discussion and help break down the stigma of addiction. And I am motivated to take my art to the next level in this service. <clears throat> Lots of things influence me. Ideas seem to come out of the blue. But I guess my art is most influenced by the ideas of the early cubists and my interest in the visual brain. For a long time now, artists have intuitively known what scientists are now confirming, how we create, perceive, and respond to art. Leonardo Vermeer Monet and Picasso all understood a great deal about visual perception. Did they know that while our eyes take in a puzzle of light, lines and other shapes, our brains pull it together, figure out what it is, and then decide how it feels about it. Recognition, narrative, and response. 
Several years ago, I went to Madrid and witnessed Picasso's Guernica, for me, arguably the greatest painting of the last 100 years. Guernica exploded my brain. I heard the screams. I felt the flames melt my skin. I could smell burning flesh. I was there. I experienced a reality beyond, beyond painting canvas. I was driven to understand how Picasso did it. I don't think that I will ever really understand, but along the way, I have discovered visual effects that other artists have used and some new ones that I stumble upon, which as it turns out, are of interest to science. So today I parlay knowledge, this knowledge along with experiments and accidents into my style and method. I study everything I can find out about the early Cubists. What were they thinking? What did they talk about amongst themselves? What did they say to their friends? So as many of us have learned, most of the writing centered on multiple viewpoints, lack of perspective, and the fragmentation of forms. But as I dug deeper, I learned that it was their goal to cause you to experience a painting <clears throat> in a way that is more than simply observing an image to evoke a greater reality, their words, to make it real. They discussed how they could experience the fourth dimension, the passage of time with multiple views, memory cues, and the exclusion of techniques that freeze an image in time, like perspective and lighting. Today, scientists say that the cubists were really onto something, and that's how we really see. I don't see a snapshot of you. I discern light lines and lines and shapes, and I process them along with a wave of nonlinear memory images and other cues that I recognize as you. I think to our common sense, this changing flow of multiple images suggests the passage of time. Sensing change may be a way that we get a taste of this greater reality. So I try to introduce change in my art, change in expression, mood, color, shape, and more. And this is all designed to get you, the viewer, to actively participate in the creation of my work, both with the visual painting and with the narrative. Now, here's the thought from Picasso. He said, I paint objects as I think them, not as I see them. And when it is finished, it still goes on changing according to the state of mind of whomever is looking at it. A picture lives only through the person who is looking at it. <clears throat> So Picasso's telling me that I lose control of the painting. The moment it is seen, experienced, and interpreted by others. And that meaning is subjective and never fixed. Picasso knew that we see not with our eyes, but with our brains. So once I understood this, I began exploring other ways to cause you, the viewer, to experience a greater reality of your own making. I'm most interested in something neuroscientists call higher level ambiguity. Higher level ambiguity creates a vacuum that you want to fill and you will do a better job than I can creating, <clears throat> creating and recreating the painting and narrative with your own perfect mental image and projected emotions. Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring is a perfect example. With a seemingly simple glance, Vermeer has set the stage for you to complete the narrative. Is she inviting? Is she frightening? Yeah, or frightened? Is she innocent, pure, or seductive? Ambiguity allows the brain of the viewer to interpret the work in a number of ways, all of which, them, uh, all of which are equally valid. In great art, something must always be left to the brain to do. Vermeer created an ambiguity that results in mutually exclusive emotional responses that at any one time seem correct and real, and over time it changes. You are certain about how you feel about this painting one moment, and then later you feel differently, just like the woman I described in the video. One day she wanted to die, and the next morning she believed there was hope.
I look to cause changes in visual perception and emotional response through my methods and style in order to create this higher level ambiguity. Your brain draws on a lifetime of past experiences, some of which are similar to the present moment, to guess the meaning of what it sees. I paint big faces. A single face without leading context invites you, the viewer, to create the narrative. We are attracted to faces, right? It is our nature. Look how babies respond to faces, how they mirror your smile. This is no accident. You know, we devote more brain power to studying the details of faces than to any other object. And we are drawn to eyes. So I exploit a shared gaze. This is not simply eyes looking at you. You engage with these eyes. Eye contact tells us that we exist. It is intimate. When eyes lock, it dominates and holds your interest. What does she see? What has she seen? It is only an image, but you make it real. And in those eyes, I use small amounts of discordant equal value opposite colors. Equal value complementary colors seen together throw our brains in a tizzy. Monet knew how to use discordant color but he probably didn't know that cones capture line and color and rods value and shading. He didn't know that they respond at different speeds, have separate neural pathways and are processed in different parts of the brain. He just knew that he could make red poppies in a green field sway in the breeze. So now that I have your attention with seemingly real eyes, I start to do other things with line, shading, and color. Vague and scribbled outlines, caricature, and unfinished sections become part of a recognizable whole as you complete the portrait your way. <clears throat> well, everybody knows this smile. Harvard professor of neurobiology, Margaret Livingstone, analyzed the Mona Lisa's face, which she filtered to separate the shading from the line work. Let me describe her findings. We have a lot more rods, think shading and value, then cones, think color and line, except in this tiny spot in our central retina, which is packed with cones. As Leonardo engages you with Mona Lisa's eyes, you see a smile or grin peripherally because you are predominantly using rods which are seeing the shading. The same is true if you view her from a distance as you engage proportionally more rods. But when you look directly at Mona Lisa's mouth up close, she has less of a grin because you are predominantly using cones in your central retina, which are seeing the line work, which is less smiley. She changes her expression ever so slightly. She is ambiguous. Leonardo has given us inconsistent line and shading cues. Of course, I incorporate this into my practice. But one thing always leads to another. How else can I use Leonardo's ideas of change to shifting expressions? Well, I sometimes paint slightly different expressions from one side of the face to the other. This frequently results in an ambiguous overall expression, or sometimes one which causes you to exclusively sense one or the other emotion at different times. You don't think you see it, but your brain does. I frequently paint multi-views or facial features that are just slightly out of alignment. I combine abstraction and caricature with naturalistic features, encouraging you to actively engage with the completion of the painting. I use iridescent and metallic paint that changes with lighting and view angle, creating new and different highlights with mid-tones and sometimes slightly changing how you perceive the mood. Here is the change over eight hours of a painting hanging in my living room. These faces are big. They're seven feet tall. They're big, but somehow intimate.
they encourage you to come close and look at the abstract details of dots, lines, and drips. Then they change as you move back as local vision becomes global vision and abstraction becomes realistic. Maybe a recipe with some or all of these ingredients might make my faces appear more real as your perception of change in time affects your consciousness. I want to provoke you into creating a reality that is more than a simple image. This is your reality born of nonlinear emotional experiences, traces of the past and mental images triggered by the cues I present. I think it is a reality which goes beyond simply observing an image. I want you to feel with certainty before you think. And then I want you to have new and different experiences over time. Each time you recreate my portraits with your own mental image, narrative and state of mind. You will do a better job completing my paintings than I can. So let me tell you about art in the time of COVID and some new directions. Our son and his wife had their hands full with two jobs, a second grader, online school, and a newborn. We decided that we'd much rather be with our family and help where we could. So we packed up Boulder and moved to Washington, DC. And so we now split our time between Boulder, Colorado, and DC. I decided not to set up a studio in DC. Because of COVID-19, I had four art exhibits postponed. Given my mission, this was the worst possible time for those affected by substance use disorder. It was time to reinvent myself. So I went digital. And so I now also create high resolution images and videos for HD display on monitors, as projections on walls, and on theater screens, and of course, as online presentations. So what? Why is this important? Well, now I can better reach more than 300,000 people that follow me on social media, and I can easily send digital images and videos to collaborators. My sister Emma said she was evil. Oh my, where did that come from? No, you are not evil. No, you are not alone. Yes, we can discuss this. Yes, we can get help. Yes, there is hope. I want to start conversations to cause people to relate, respond, and take action before it is too late to be part of the solution to help erase the stigma. And there's hope because of all of us, right? Over the past couple of years, I've collaborated on exhibitions and presentations with several organizations, and I'm always looking for more to collaborate with. Here are some of the organizations that I've recently worked with. NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, Colorado Department of Human Services, University of Colorado Center for Bioethics and Humanities, Kaiser Permanente, Case Western Reserve, the University of Michigan, Addiction Center, the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma, documentary filmmakers at Under the Hood Productions, NPR for two interviews, one of which was picked up by the BBC, the Scripps Television Network of more than 100 local TV stations, and multiple, multiple podcasters. So let me finish by showing you a project which I did with NIDA. It is a short video which makes for a nice summary of, of my discussion here today. And of course, I'll be here for questions after it concludes. So I'll see you in four minutes. I'm William Stair. I'm an artist, and I'd like to share some of my thoughts about addiction, stigma, and my art. My sister died from an opiate overdose. Emma was 57 years old and she struggled with drugs and alcohol for most of her life. Emma used booze, pot and meth in high school. But when she had the first of her failed back surgery, prescription opiates took over. And when the pain continued, the doctors were all too willing to prescribe more. Now, Emma loved my art. And I promised her that I would paint her portrait if she went back to rehab. She agreed, 
And for five years, she seemed to be in recovery. It was wonderful to see her laugh and smile. But then her beautiful husband died. Then more back surgery and more pills. She relapsed. She died. The loss of my sister to this overdose <clears throat> greatly affected me as an artist. The voice in my head was whispering, what good is your art? What does it accomplish? What does it matter? What are you passionate about? I started to broadly explore victims, witnesses, and survivors of violence, bigotry, and addiction. Viewers interpreted my work within their own subjective context. It was all related to their own experiences, which is exactly what I wanted. But again, the voice returned and asked, how can you honestly relate to these issues? Well, I can relate to addiction. I wasn't simply reflecting my feelings. I had in some small way embodied the experience, not as a victim, but as a witness. I was a witness. Emma OD'd, but maybe to the millions affected, I could be part of the solution. Stigma seemed like the place to start. Well, I jumped down the rabbit hole and never looked back. Soon I was painting four foot faces, then five foot faces, then seven foot faces. People had strong, passionate reactions to my first show of faces. I found my voice. I now had a goal and a purpose. I was in search of this greater reality and my cause was addiction. With alcohol and drug abuse, it's never just one person that's impacted. And it's never simply an isolated instance. And so the faces I now paint are the faces of those affected, the victims, witnesses, and survivors. And so the affected now stood in front of my paintings and some cried. They bravely shared their stories. They described the silent suffering, the terror, chaos, uncertainty, and helplessness but they also saw resilience, forgiveness, and hope. Emma said that she was evil. Oh my, where did that come from? No, you're not evil. No, you're not alone. Yes, we can discuss this. Yes, there is hope. Yes, we can get help. So for all of you watching this today, don't be embarrassed or ashamed. Don't assume that you can do this by yourself. Share the load, ask for help. If you know someone, spouse, parent, friend, child, or anyone who suffers from an addiction to drugs or alcohol, don't wait. Thank you so much, William. Um, were you ready to move to Q&A portion? I sure am. Okay, excellent. So we've got quite a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. The first question says, your personal experience led to your advocacy of anti-stigma practices. How do you get those who do not have a personal connection or experience to see the importance? Hmm. Well, that's actually a pretty good question. And, and of course, um, you know, my experience really drove it in, into me and that this was something I had to do. But I, I, I think right now it is becoming so prevalent. So, so just take teenagers. So, you know, when you look at the whole spectrum of, of, um, of um, people that are afflicted with this, it's a small percentage, but it's, it's a growing one in terms of overdose deaths. There's a lot of people out there with kids and there's a lot of people that ought to be talking about this to their kids. And if they can't talk to them about it with their kids, they ought to be doing things or encouraging things where the kids can get the information that they need. Um, I, I think it has become such a major issue in this country that every politician ought to be concerned about it. Every medical professional ought to be concerned about it. Every teacher ought to be concerned about it. And I think as we continually work to get the message out and multiple people do it, I think those that are unaffected will see and be part of the solution. The other thing is <clears throat> there's people politically that are standing in, um, in the way of the solution. And the more this gets out, 
The more the discussion is normalized, the more we talk about it, the more we're able to change the minds of those people that can help affect change. Absolutely. That was uh, a startling yeah. point that you mentioned in your in your talk that uh, that drug use amongst the youth has not increased, but overdose has. So yeah. certainly, yeah, education and getting the word out is key. So follow up question to that, then what what role and I'm assuming the answer is yes, but how how does just the everyday person get involved um, if they're not medical or, you know, in the in political work? How do they kind of get involved and help support these efforts and get the get the word out? Mm -hmm. OK, so one of the things I tell people is that there are many things in this world that need people like you to get involved with. Pick one. So in other words, not everyone is going to gravitate to <clears throat> overdose deaths in opiate use. But there are other issues that they could get involved with. And I think it's really important that everyone gets involved with something. And, uh, and maybe if they can't do it right now, to make a plan where they can. And so I, I, I think it's difficult to try to put everyone into the, the same place that I am right now and, and everyone who's listening to this is. But, um, but, but there's things that people can do and that they should be doing. And, and of course, once you start caring, once you start helping, once you start working in a um, um, dinner line at a homeless shelter or wherever it is, you enter into these discussions and you make yourself available to those discussions. And I mean, I, I, you know, once people understand that um, addiction is a disease of the brain, and that, that it's, it's a not a moral failing, I think that just opens up so much. And so we just need to get that message out. And the way to do it is, like I was saying earlier, you know, with this groundswell, and I, I think the arts just play such an important role in this and in getting people to listen where they wouldn't listen to their teacher, they won't listen to maybe, um, you know, a law enforcement official or, or a, a medical professional, but it's just people actively talking about it. And people will join in, um, you know, they, they will help friends and, and they will participate in projects. But I think the whole thing is just got to rise up, rise up, rise up in our consciousness. Absolutely. It's an excellent <clears throat> action and reminder for, for all of us. Um, we've got a few more questions here. So one question says, what can we do to address stigma in our daily lives, especially if we have family members who are experiencing substance use disorder? Sure. One of the first things is, is to take the phone call. So he, he, here's how it goes. You know, it does not happen with us. We're going out to dinner. <laughs> we're, we're in Boulder. <clears throat> the door is just opening. I look at my phone and it's my sister calling. I know she's drunk uh, at that point. And you got to take that phone call, you know, and, and even though every call won't be productive, you've got to let them know that you care and, and you know, that, that, that they exist. And that's so important. That's the most important message, common message that comes to me at the art exhibits as people come up and they'll say, I'm a, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, thank you for this. It lets me know I'm not alone, that I exist. And when I use those words in my talk, those were words that people were saying to me. And that's so important to just to acknowledge that people are human. And you know, we see those people on the street, don't we? We walk by them all the time. And we look the other way. And sometimes I think j just a smile helps. Um, and, and so there's just so many ways that, that we can help people to know that they're real human beings. We don't have to lecture them. We just have to acknowledge that they exist. And I think that's just such an important first step in, in this whole process. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can certainly be one of those things where you say, oh, well, I don't have to do it. Somebody else will. But if everybody thought, well, I'm the one who's going to say hi to someone or answer that call, then certainly, you know, no one would be looking around and saying, oh, someone else will do it. Someone else will help out. Someone else will get involved. Um, we hear from our hospital teams a lot that, and they're addressing opioid response within the hospitals and in the community that just showing up is the first step. Um, show up for the people that you say you will show up for. Um, if you are, you know, they, the peer recovery coaches will work with, um, you know, patients who have come through who are um, not quite ready for treatment. So they'll, you know, 
continue to reach out. They'll call, they'll meet them, they'll show up for them. And in a lot of ways, it encourages the patient that they can do it too. You know, they can show up when they need to as well. So really great stuff. Um, do you have any thoughts on how hospital teams can approach addressing stigma for SUD patients, a little more clinical from the clinical side? Oh, and what was the last part of it? What kind of patients for? Sure. SUD patients. Oh, yes, right. Okay. Well, certainly language plays a part of it. And, and I heard part of that. I caught the uh, p- part of the previous discussion. And language is such a big part of it. And, and w- sometimes we don't know the right word to use. And so we fall back on abuser, drug abuser and addict b- because we don't know another word, but they're out there, the, the other words. And I think that's part of it. Um, and, you know, it's funny that over time, then those new words we use are, will probably become stigmatized. But, but that's part of it. But I look at my sister and my experience there, and I look at a doctor who dismissed her and, um, you know, didn't, didn't, I'm, I'm still amazed by the fact that he didn't correctly assess her, her back issues or have her go to the right place. And those are all things that we would have done. We would have asked more questions. We would have asked to see specialists, but she didn't do that. And, um, I, I, I don't know what it must be like to time and time again, see the same person in the emergency room okay? and to see someone who's been using needles, you, you know, they're um, a drug abuser. And, and how, how do you time and time again, get to them? I think it just takes great strength on your part to be able to do that again and again and again, knowing they're going to be back or worse yet, knowing they might die. And I, I just think that's, um, you, you've got to be able to do that. People don't deserve to die. Now, in order to do that, guess what? You can have money, don't you? You've got to have, a, you've got to have enough staff. You've got to have um, funding that might, might have to come from the federal government or the, the state government or, or the city and to be able to correctly staff to help these people. So it's a major project, but the person who treats that person in the hospital is just one part of, of that whole whole project. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing we hear a lot from our hospital teams and community partners is that, you know, for other diseases than addiction, you know, if somebody comes back in multiple times, they're not judged, you know, for example, like if somebody comes back in with a repeat heart attack, they're treated the same way as they were the first time. Um, But there is stigma and it's different for people who are coming in with um, substance use. So thank you for that. Um, Next question says, have you ever done art with those experiencing addiction like art therapy? Do you think art therapy is a useful tool for supporting people with substance use disorder? Okay, first of all, I think art therapy is a very useful tool, but I have never participated in it. And um, you know, when I've been asked about that, you know what I like to have my art in an, first of all, I, I never say no to anybody, but, but um, uh, I sit back and I've always thought of art therapy as being something that you as an artist um, gain the benefit of. So I'm the person in art therapy every time I paint, right? And, and so <clears throat> I, I'm not sure how my art would help, let, let's say, a um, uh, SUD um, uh, victim, uh, if, if they were painting like I was, how that would help them. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not an art therapist. But I do know that people respond so strongly in my shows. And, and when I talked earlier about how you, the viewer, make the painting real, they make it real. They go in and they start, now this is not everyone, but a high percentage will start crying in front of the painting. And they'll say, you are describing in that painting exactly how I feel. You, your painting exactly describes how depression feels. Your painting made me think about uh, our son who I know has a problem. And now I'm, I'm definitely going to get involved uh, with the, the process of uh, an intervention. And so I know that happens. And, and so I guess we can call that therapy as well in, in that it's, it's helping people it's helping people share their feelings in this environment. And it's really pretty amazing. And then hopefully it'll continue. Absolutely. Um, And similarly to to what we're discussing, you touched on this a little bit in your your talk, 
what other mediums of art have you seen be really powerful? Obviously you've described, you know, situations where people see your art and it describes how they feel. Are there other um, sort of mediums that you've seen really be affected music or, you know, anything, anything else? Well, I just listened to an album the other day and uh, <clears throat> often I'm drawing a blank. The, um, I'll think of them again. But here, here was a popular um, band, and their entire album was about alcohol and addiction. And, and I thought, that was a really gutsy thing to do. <clears throat> and I'm always amazed when I listen to music, the messages that are in so much music. And there are so many fine musicians out there that are consistently doing really powerful pieces that people relate to. So I think music is an obvious one. Uh, there, there is an organization, they're called Under the Hood Productions, and they do documentaries. And they just did a documentary on a uh, uh, heroin addict in Detroit, and he's a boxer, and it's great. And the University of Michigan just premiered that. And it, it's a wonderful story, and the art of that movie, that documentary, became then the the starting point for other discussions. So there, there were panels with people from uh, the National um, Institute on Drug Abuse and, and with local doctors and people from the University of Michigan. And that's part of the strength of the shows. So um, events, music, art openings, movies, can pull people in to see other things that are built around it. And, and those seem to me to be the most powerful. But having said that, you know, on TV, um, Dope Sick, I'm sure most of you watched, watched that movie, um, that series, it was wonderful and powerful and, and just told such a, a terrible story. And, um, you know, things like that are starting to happen. The books that are coming out right now uh, to, to talk about it. And so you, know, you, just, you just have to have this broad range of many different people coming out with these stories, coming out with these exhibits, coming out with these documentaries, and you'll start to affect people. But like I said earlier, it's gotta be a groundswell. It just can't be one. It's, it's gotta be this groundswell. Lots of people have to get involved with this. So I'm always encouraging other artists, get involved, do a show, <clears throat> pick, pick whatever it is you're passionate about, but talk about it, wear it on your sleeve. <clears throat> Absolutely. So in our earlier session, we talked a little bit about how sometimes media portrayal can perpetuate um, stigma and discrimination. So how can we be informed consumers of different art forms that make sure that we are not uh, perpetuating a stigma and that we're actually learning and, and breaking down those barriers? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, well, I think, um, I, pr I probably think the, the older the media, the movie or the program or the book, you know, the more it's likely to have stigmatizing language um, and, and characters that might be um, not reflective of how we should be looking at people today. And, you know, I don't know, I, I, I think uh, to be a, a good consumer, I mean, how, how are you a consumer of, of movies? You talk to friends, they tell you about a movie, you read a review, you, uh, you go online and see what the New York Times had to say about it, and, and you make a judgment. So, um, you know, if you're just looking at it blindly, um, you know, I, I, I think you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's certainly great. And, um that in itself can help sort of spread the word, you know, talking, oh, have you seen this movie? Oh, no, I have it, you know, so that can kind of help with that um, sort of groundswell that you've mentioned. So we've got time for one more question here. Um, and mm -hmm. this question comes from Dr. Maxine Lawson. She is the pharmacy director at one of our hospitals. I'll give her a shout out. Um, sure. She says, thank you for a humanistic approach to treatment. You supplied a point of view that helps empower the individuals. How can we develop more forums that are available to both clinicians and individuals struggling with substance abuse? It seems like it would be good to bring the two together in a learning platform. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I do. That's what I look forward to doing, right? So the last four <clears throat> major exhibitions I've had, <clears throat> 
have all been built around this concept. So if I'm, uh, I have an art show and I'm doing it in conjunction, uh, collaboration with Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Permanente brings in their counselors and there's, there are people that are directly involved and we have a panel discussion. And, and then we may have a discussion after that to talk about how can we take this to a broader community. So I think it all starts with talking, right? <clears throat> so I'm very interested in, in uh, doing these shows. And uh, this year in um, Colorado, I had two concurrent shows. And one was um, a collaboration that included Kaiser Permanente, and the other was with the, the University of Colorado. And we split the town. And they were on the same time, they were co-promoted, and people could go to both if, if they wanted, but they were events that talked about the issue. And then they were attended by high school groups, by uh, college students, art students, clubs. And so groups came out to these as well. And, and groups are great too, because sometimes you can get a discussion in a group. Sometimes you can't <laughs> because of the stigma. And, and so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's doing this and, and I know other people. So for instance, I can put you in contact uh, uh, with the um, documentary filmmakers who did the piece uh, for the University of Michigan and they would love to do this. And they've also cooperated with uh, NIDA. And, and so uh, I find NIDA being very proactive in working with people to get the word out regarding stigma because they recognize as much as all of you do you can't do your job if there's stigma. If I saw a, a, a statistic the other day that said only 20% 20, 20 of people who should have care get care. 20%. So how do we reach these other people? Well, I think we just have to normalize the discussion and keep having uh, discussions like this. Absolutely. Um, what an excellent way to end our session and our day. Um, William, we want to thank you so much for sharing such a personal experience with us. Um, as evidenced by the chat, this was really touching for a lot of people, and um, we really appreciate you being so personal and, and sharing your story with us. Um, I also want to thank everyone who joined us today um, for day two of our symposium. We hope you'll join us tomorrow. We have two panel discussions. One is regional best practices in hospital-based harm reduction, and the other is innovative approaches to care for special populations with substance use disorder. Hope you have a nice afternoon, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you.